the organizer for giving me this opportunity to give a talk on, on a subject I've been studying for many, many years. Uh, so, endotrial modules. Um, so, I think that this is the first talk for some of you about endotrial modules, therefore I will start gently. Uh, I would like also to, to say that at the start that I've been impressed so far in this past two days of the diversity of mathematics that we have seen, just essentially about a single kind of algebraic structure, which is a finite G. Uh, a finite group and different perspective from topology, from holotopy theory, from algebra. Not so much of algebra, I think, uh, in my test. So this is my perspective. I try to bring some more diversity uh, from the purely algebraic viewpoint, very traditional um, modular representation theory. I will start with the background, trying to, to do a crash course of 50 years on endotrial modules, just kind of five, ten minutes, um, because I think it's important to set the background and my viewpoint on these kind of representations. And otherwise, some of the second part of the talk will be on various joint work, mainly with um, John Carlson, Jesper Rodal, and Dan Nakano. So, let us get started. At any point, feel free to interrupt if there is anything that you don't understand. So, G will be a final group. And in this talk, K is a field of characteristic P, which is positive, and I assume that P divides the order of the group. So, this is the basic setting for. Um, what your representation theory. And then I will look at KG modules, finitely generated KG modules. So KG mod is the category of finitely generated KG modules. Uh, and as usual, out of this category, we take the quotient category of stable, the stable module category, where we take the quotient by all the morphisms switch factors to projective modules. So, the stable module category, I think that's the reason why I've been asked to give a talk, to underline the background of this. Um, and just a little bit of notation, whenever I answer that's the schedule of M, So just as the <coughs> it's equipped with the structure of KG module itself. And I write, if I write a tensor product, unless otherwise stated, that means the tensor product has vector spaces. If I take tensor product of two modules, then that's equipped with a diagonal of action. Right, so this is the background. And over this background, I can set up the main definition which is that of an endotrial module. So M, a KG module, is endotrivial. Uh, if, well, I start with the definition which motivates the name endotrivial. And if it's endomorphism algebra, so this is taking the k vector space module homomorphism from N to M, this is the kg module, which is isomorphic to k in the stable module category, which I denote as st mod kg. So this justifies the name. Now, in practice, it's much easier to ask a computer, for instance, to tell the computer to calculate something else to see if a module is endotrivial. And this definition here is equivalent to saying that if we take M, the dual of M tensor with M, 
as isomorphic to something that looks like the direct sum of a, a trivial module k plus some projective module. Okay. Uh, for those who have seen this talk many times, I will set this because I know that in this audience there are so many people who have seen this sort of talk hundreds of times, and I don't want them to fall asleep. <laughs> so I will set for these people some homework exercises to keep their mind busy and avoid them to sleep, hopefully. And this is the first exercise for them to do to show that uh, the two notions are correct. <laughs> Um, and another thing that's considered a small exercise, if you wish, uh, but that's to show that if M is endotrivial, I'm very lazy, so I just write ET for endotrivial, uh, if and only if, because M is finitely generated, we can use the Kushmit um, theorem, which tells us that M can be decomposed in, into a direct sum of indecomposable summons in essentially a unique way. And it means that if we do this decomposition, we get a unique non-projective summons, which is indecomposable and endotrivial. So, this fact is very, very nice because then we can define the set T of G, which is the set of stable isoclasses of endotrivial modules, so such that M is an uh, endotrivial KG module, and these brackets denote the stable isoclasses. Uh, this is a set, but you can also equip it with uh, the structure of an abelian group, which is induced by the tensor product. That is, if we take the sum of two elements, that's the class of the tensor product of these two elements. Now, here comes the nasty exercise for those who have seen this talk, because it's a non-trivial result actually. It's a trick exercise. Uh, it's a, I would say it's a theorem which is due to uh, Louis Puch in the case of finite P groups, and then um, many John Carson did the, the bulk of the work to extend the result to arbitrary finite, uh, finite groups. Uh, but it's saying that T of G is finitely generated. Finitely generated. Saying that it's a finitely generated abelian group, we go back to our undergraduate days of just abstract algebra, and we remember that they have a very nice decomposition. So we can write T of G as being some finite group, which is the torsion subgroup. <coughs> <coughs> And there is some torsion free direct sum complement. So TT of G is what I denote as torsion subgroup. So the torsion subgroup of T of G and it's finite. Because the group is finitely generated. So this is now what is the point, perhaps? Let me just break here, because the point is that these endotrial modules, why would we care about them? Uh, initially, they were studied only for finite P groups, because what Everett did noticed in the late 70s is that if it takes, if you took um, a simple modules for finite P soluble group, P soluble group, <coughs> you come from the other side of the bond, um, then the source of that module is an endopermutation module. And endopermutation modules, he could in some way build them up using endotrial modules. So this is why this mattered at the beginning. But then, of course, this category, the stable module category, came much more into force. And um, if you think of what is an endotrial module, it is an invertible object. 
So tensor equity um, with an endotrial module gives you a self-equivalence of that category, uh, which is invertible. So it's also something that's sometimes called the PICA group, PICA group, and um, I think that's also the reason why I'm here today. Um, so this matters. So this is why once we have such a nice <coughs> gadget, we want to classify all of them if we can. You remember that in general it's impossible to classify all uh, finite generated KG modules in decomposable. But this class of modules, maybe we have a chance. And indeed, if G is a finite P group, then uh, this is a theorem. Officially, I think I should attribute this theorem to um, Serge Book and Jack Devna. But if we think of the whole story, there are many contributors to that uh, to that result. Uh, it says that if G is a finite P group, then G of G can be explicitly given by generators and relations. Okay, so this is started in a sense. I'm not giving any details about the shape of these generators. I'm happy to talk about it later on with those who have never seen that. All that we need to know is that if G is a finite P group, then C of G is, uh, is known. And moreover, if, so unless... You mean John Carlson and Jack said that, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. No, because I was talking with Marcus and we were talking about the fermentation module. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, John Carlson and Jack did now. Um, that's your fault, <laughs> um, So unless, you know, of course, um, G is cyclic, uh, semi-dihedral, or generalized quaternion, Then we have that in fact it's a torsion free group. Uh, if G is dihedral, mm -hmm. then T of G is just uh, Z cross Z, uh, Z plus Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in fact, cyclic, we need uh, cyclic of order at least three. Uh, <coughs> so, and um, so the example. The example, I would say, the main example that you need to remember, because quite often that's the only one that comes into, um, that matters, is the following. Uh, if you take, you start with a, project, uh, with a trivial module, okay, and you take a projective presentation of it, take the minimal one. So I just denote it as P0, <coughs> and you take the kernel of that, that's a, often called the CCG. And this guy is endotrivial. And if you take the minimal projective presentation of it, then uh, this guy is also in the composable. Now, uh, another way to get <coughs> more endotrial modules from given endotrial modules is that if you have an exact sequence Maybe two examples. This is the first one. Uh, and the second one is that for any exact sequence of the form like that, with P projective, then we have the following result is that M is endotrivial. 
You can only if and is and not trivial. So that this allows us to construct a bunch of new endotrial modules if we have given some. In particular, we see that all the CCDs, positive, negative, whichever direction you take, uh, would be endotrivial. So, right. Now, the, the main task for us today is to try and see what can be done for arbitrary finite groups. And then we start with describing kind of the general strategy of how this has been done um, so far, starting with the old-fashioned way, because this is where you see the difference with some new techniques that, for instance, Jasper and uh, Paul Palmer also have come up with. I find that there is a shift in the perspective of how do we try to tackle these industrial modules. The traditional perspective has been as follows. So we start with a finite group G, and then if we pick our silo, our favorite silo subgroup, silo P subgroup, and then what we do is that we have the normalizer NG of S, and in it, well, there is just the inclusion here. The traditional way to see to, to study these kind of representations is to observe that S is normal in its normalizer. It's kind of obvious, often it's represented just as a double bar here. Uh, and so from the representations of S, using the fact that here we have a normal inclusion, we can try and say something about what are the endotrial modules for the normalizer. Um, so here, using that S is normal in its normalizer, and the index is P prime. Let me just call this N for short. Uh, so P does not divide the index. Then we, we want to say something about um, T of N. And here again, the result is known. So in the sense that T of n, so recall that we know T of s, the group of endotrial ks modules by generators and relations. So <coughs> using this description, we see that T of n is isomorphic. So the usual thing, we look at the n fixed points of T of S. That means we took, we take, can see that from the module perspective, by taking the stable isoclasses of the endotrial KS modules, which are stable under N conjugate. That means that if you have M, which is the endotrial KS module, you can look at its conjugate module, often denoted like that. Uh, it's again a <coughs> KS module, because S is normal in, in N, so you can make this action work. And if GM is isomorphic to M as KS module for all G that are in N, then um, the module in fact extends to M. And this is why we can extend um, some endotrial modules for S in this way. But be careful, this works only because the modules are in fact endopermutations, and this is a result of every data that uh, this works well at this level. And that's not all, because we must remember that if we take the quotient N mod S, that's a P prime group. So perhaps that P prime group may have one dimensional representations, <coughs> which you can inflate to N. And this also would be endotrivial. Um, so I think that the usual way to grant this is to say that we take all the uh, group homomorphism from N to the units uh, of K, so the one dimensional KN modules, which is 
I, which can be identified to a subgroup of n modulo GR subgroup of n times s. If you're smart, you can take k large enough so that you ensure to get all of the one-dimensional representations of n. Um, so that's for the first part. So it's generated by those, right? But it need not be split. No, this is why you just write a plus and not the dark sum. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, and okay. it's not split okay. in okay. general. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, right. And then but, well, well, you're, you're choosing a lifting, so like it could be one or four, right? With yeah. two things and what two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so now what do we do? Because here, we are here. And how do we go from N to G? So this is where... You use the, something that's called the grid correspondence. So from N to G, as, you, as you're noticing, uh, I take here a bottom-up approach, a bottom-up strategy to find T of G and if we have the endotrial Kn modules, how do we find endotrial Kg modules? The first naive thing to do from my viewpoint is to use the green correspondence um, <coughs> which I won't explain what it is because that would take too long uh, but the essence of it is that it is a map which goes from so it's um, it's a correspondence between the KN modules and the KG modules which gives us some kind of well-behaved correspondence and in this case what the green correspondence does is that it ensures that if we take the restriction map from G to N and we look at what it does on endotrial KG modules, then this map ends up in endotrial K modules and this is injected. But we must be careful that it is injective in general, not subjective. Which means that uh, the image of T of G will be mapped into this guy here. Uh, okay, so there are some cases in which this is very well behaved. So in particular, so that works well. The first trivial case is that if g is equal to n, <coughs> this, I think that's okay. Uh, we can make it slightly more general here. I'm not going to say this uh, <coughs> now. Uh, it works also well in the opposite case. It works also well if s is ti, namely trivial intersection. That means what? That means that if you take two conjugates, G and uh, GS, and you intersect them, that's a P-prime group, so that's just trivial uh, for all G, which are in G, but not in N. Another way to put it is saying that N is strongly embedded, and indeed, uh, this also, this condition here can be a bit relaxed and generalized if we know a bit of um, a bit more group theory uh, from local to global theory. Right. So, uh, 
There are still a few things that we can say in general. And now this is where I need to trial the German way. So, uh, yeah, now the main thing is that we have this dichotomy. So, C of G, I just remind people that it can be written as CT of G, our exam with a torsion free complement. And this allows for a dichotomy of the of how do we find all endotrial caging modules? And I will therefore also split now the two into two different parts. Starting with kind of that I'm more comfortable with. I'm more comfortable with because it goes by just to straight group theory and I like it. Uh, that's looking at TF of G just as the structure of an abelian group. So I will look at TF of G just as a torsion free abelian group. So that is, it's a torsion free abelian group, say that it's isomorphic to Z to some power. The number of copies of that. And actually, we know what this number here is. Uh, it has been proved by several people in different versions, etc. But let me give you what it is. <coughs> so, MG, I will state it, that's the number of connected components um, of so I think that if I don't write it like that some people will just complain if we take the poset of non-cyclic elementary abelian piece groups of G, and we take the G orbit where G acts by conjugation on this poset. Okay, so the best way to realize it is that if you fix your favorite CL subgroup, you look in it at its non-cyclic elementary abelian piece groups, that gives you a nice poset. I think we've seen a nice one yesterday. I'm not going to try and compete with the drawing, <laughs> but that gives us a nice poset. And by connected components, I mean that two elementary abelian subgroups in that process are connected if we can go from one to the other by a chain of inclusion, containment, in chain, etc. And we take these inclusions up to G conjugation. So there is also some fusion that goes into that. Um, well, so in a sense, we, it boils down to some just 
Kigo theory, some fusion systems, etc. in the background also. Uh, and that's nice because we can bound this number. So we always know that n of g is at most p plus 1. Whatever g is, if p is odd, always forget p is equal to 2. And of course, if, two, if p is 2, then we replace 2 by 4, and that is at most 5 if p is 2. These are results respectively due to, uh, this is John Carson, uh, right? And uh, this is me, but I would say that it's just a corollary of um, a work of uh, Laszlo Hetelli on soft circles. And we also have another bound. This time it's a bound on the P rank of G. Okay? And we know that n of g is 1 whenever again I will take two cases so there, there is uh, g has p rank uh, greater than p if p is odd And greater than 4 if p is 2. I said if p is 2, you just take 2 and take 4 instead. Uh, and these are results uh, of Anne McWilliams in the 70s. Okay? Uh, and this is uh, George Gloverman and myself more than 10 years ago. P rank means the size of the maximal element you get. The maximal size of uh, Elementary and empty subgroups because maximal elementary and empty subgroups can have different tracks. Yeah. We take oh, the okay. maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the picture. So now essentially what is nice is that you can ask a computer, you can ask Magma or Gap, and say, this is my group, calculate me that number just by looking at four sets of groups. And that the computer does it very well. So you can find just the structure of TF of G by looking as the pizza group structure, the fusion in there. Uh, before giving you some example of it, I will just say the upshot of this part. I give you a flavor about, yeah, by saying that if we look at T of N, we take some fixed point below. And then we look at the one-dimensional modules. But if you think of these one-dimensional K in modules, that's essentially those which are in the kernel of the restriction map from N to S. And here it is the same. The question of finding TT of G boils down to finding uh, the kernel of the restriction from G to S from the group of endotrial KG modules to that of endotrial KS modules. So something I have not said, but that's another exercise for the old crowd, uh, is that if you take the restriction map, uh, the restriction of endotrial module for G is an endotrial the H module for any subgroup H of G. So this is a well-defined map, and the kernel of this map, this is the crucial bit. Uh, because it's a kernel, I will just call it K of S. <coughs> uh, sorry, K of G. Okay. So I fix my S, it's, my S is, uh, is my, my friend, and I don't need to write it. So I will come back to this very shortly, but I think that perhaps now is a good time to have an example. Uh, so, example with very important groups. Uh, 
of TFOG for very important groups. <coughs> and that's the Hello. <laughs> Example. Uh, yeah. If you ask people what's their favorite examples, uh, in general they tell you that there is some kind of symmetry group and maybe there is some final group of V type, whatever that means. Um, but namely, for me, I would just take SL and Q. Uh, and as I will take, I will take the symmetry group of the group P squared. Uh, and if I want, I mean, the trick here is that I want to show you the difference that can happen at the level of the fusion. If you take <coughs> two final groups which have isomorphic silo P subgroups, but where this thing here, this bucket here, uh, has different shape. And so here we'll take P dividing Q plus Q minus one. Uh, ideally, you can even think of P being the highest power of P dividing Q minus one. So P squared does not divide Q minus one. And because there is always the left and the right, uh, if I take SLP, people will complain if I don't take the corresponding PGLP. <coughs> I use of the board. Just make and I will take the corresponding PG and P Q where P divides Q minus one. Exactly once. So, in all these cases, my silo subgroup is the risk product of a cyclic P with a cyclic P. In the same in here. Um, Sorry, it's the same, it's not the same here. Uh, but in here, I will take, I should have taken a, a fourth column here to say that it's the same as in GLP. Uh, GLP. PQ. <coughs> now, what happens if you take a silo piece of group of SLPQ? for this congruences of Q, then it means that you're just chopping off the head of that group. You're taking a subgroup of maximum, a uh, maximum subgroup of that S. So I will just write it as S naught. Um, if you think of this guy as being a semi-direct product of a CP cross CP P times with a cyclic P, then this one will just have one less uh, CP in the, in the base group. And instead here, you're chopping off the feet of, of that, uh, that group. So you're moving out the center. Uh, and so here we just call it S bar, which is S modulo Z of S. Uh, and so here, if you take, if you take uh, this process of non-cyclic elementary and piece of groups, in SP squared, that is sort of the same as you have just for S, in the sense that uh, you have this big elementary abelian P subgroup of rank P. Uh, we call it V because it's like a vector space, which has rank P. And it has all the subgroups in there. And then you have a unique conjugacy class of CP cross CP, which are maximum. So, in the terms of torsion tree and the tree and modules, you have two components in your facet, which are not fused. So, you get that TF of G is isomorphic to Z squared. Now, what happens is that in GLPQ, 
you've got exactly the same silo, I mean, isomorphic silo P subgroups, but now, by some D theory argument, you find out that this element of the here, which was maxima, becomes conjugate to a subgroup in there. Therefore, here, you get that the TF of G is just that, because your poset now has just one component. This one is conjugate to something that lives in this big component. Right. So now what happens if you chop off the head of, of your S? So you are now in SLPQ. Uh, and here, well, it's not too bad because <coughs> there is a nice result perhaps due to big interpretation of a result of Steinberg. Yes, but he knows about it on top of his head. Um, which tells you that any elementary DNP piece of group is conjugated to one of maximal rank. Okay. So here, even if your S is not quite the same, you're just chopped off the head, you still get that for here also, you get that TF of G for G equal to um, SLPQ. Then you also get just a cyclic um, torsion free part. And what is nice about the fact that it's cyclic is that you have a generator. Okay. Some people may talk at a later date about what happens if you have more than one copies of that. So what are the generators? I don't know them, but uh, some people in this in this meeting will know about it and may talk about it at some point. Um, but the generator here is just the example I give you at the start. So it's the stabilizer class of the CCD. What happens now if you take PGLPQ? Okay, so this is an exercise for those who like these kind of groups. Because I'm just going to, going to give you the answer. It's three. Okay, so here I have not said, but P is greater than two. P is odd in this case. <coughs> um, and it is three. Okay, so this is an exercise for, for those of you who start dozing up uh, to show that it's, you have three conjugacy classes. I mean, three components to your concept. You see that in your little picture there? I mean, you're not getting rid of the diagonal and CP cross CP, right? Eh? So, in the picture, it becomes kind of tricky because I'm, I'm chopping off one of these. See, so this is precisely why it's interesting because my concept, what does become, if I, if I mod out the center, it means that this guy becomes cyclic. And here, well, you lose all the bottom here. Uh, but however, the elements which were not abelian before, for instance, x was special, p cube, exponent p, and you've modeled the z, so they become cp cross cps. And so you need to take all of this into consideration. And this is where fusion is interesting. So this is the theorem that, that the rank is this number. Uh, is it constructive? I mean, does it give you your, your end of trivia models? Like rationally, I think. So you can find that, yes, rationally, so. Uh, but not, let's say, like a basis for it. No, uh, I think that yes, we have some methods which comes from homotopy theory, but uh, using. This kind of uh, of method, no, unfortunately. Yeah, it's an obstruction for realizing.
Some of you are very fast. Okay, another exercise is what happens in the defining characteristic. So, if I take a finite group of lead up in defining characteristic, um, that's another exercise. Uh, I would like to take an example where this poset is disconnected for the silo. And so in this case, I mentioned just before the extra special P groups. And <coughs> I would like people to think about SL, SL3P and uh, PGL3P. Just as two examples. Uh, and to see what happens. TF of G. So I can give you the answers. Uh, in this case, it is for SL3P, that is 3 if 3 uh, does not divide P minus 1. It is 5 if uh, 3 divides P minus 1. So this is for this guy here, for SL3P. And for PGL3P, that is always three copies of that. So it's a nice exercise actually that could give you to your undergraduate students if you are teaching some, some group theory course, some zero theory, some, you know, just some well advanced algebra. Um, but what now for TT of G? So I said that for finding torsion trivial torsion endotrial modules, it suffices to, if you could, to look at the kernel of the restriction map from G to S, <coughs> from the group of endotrial KG modules to that of and the three KS modules. And this is where the new strategies um, come into force. So there is one by Jasper, there is also one by uh, Paul Balmer. We've been looking at this shift of focus. So instead of taking this bottom up approach to finding TT of G, they take, as I find it, as I see it, a top-down approach. <coughs> and what, what they do, for instance, Jasper is using homotopy theory, looking at the, the, the orbit category of G, the P orbit category of G, and um, calculating some homotopy groups. Which I'm still trying to understand, but uh, uh, the theorem. So that's uh, Rodin in 19, uh, 18, 20, I don't. Uh, there has been some lag between that, but it's uh, that's. K of G is isomorphic to uh, the first homology group of the orbit category of P subgroups of G <coughs> to K cross in its usual setting. And it describes, it gives an explicit isomorphism. 
So it's, I would feel kind of very intruder if I, if I wanted to try and explain to you how that works, because the author is here and he would be very happy to talk to you about it. Uh, I would like instead to, <laughs> to, um, to first make an observation out of it, is that, well, in some sense, it gives us another proof that this K of G is an abelian, so a finite abelian <coughs> P prime group. So P prime meaning of order not divisible by P. Uh, and it also gives us, I'm going to show you how, uh, in an example, a way to calculate this group explicitly, especially when the zero is not too big. I, I mean, the zero is quite nice. For instance, it's a billion. Uh, and I will take as an example this time again an SLN Q uh, where P does not divide Q and see how that works. So what is the upshot? Um, the upshot is that I have a sort of a null hypothesis. I suppose that what is true is that this guy is trivial quite often, if I have a perfect group. Okay? Because I don't expect anything other than one dimensional KG modules. This is my conjecture. Um, and of course, if the group, the group is perfect, then there is none. So, how do we prove or disprove this? Null conjecture, this null hypothesis, uh, is by looking at the p-local structure of a group like that. Now, what is nice about this kind of finite groups of V-type is that, in fact, the p-local structure does not depend so much on p and q, but rather on the multiplicative order of q modulo p and the V-type. So, in the following sense, uh, in the sense that if I take a silo P subgroup in there, this subgroup has a nice characteristic abelian subgroup which is homocyclic. So it has in there some kind of abelian a homocyclic P group which is uh, of the form CP to the R some power, cross, etc. A certain number of times, the run, which we can gather from, uh, from just from n and this multiplicative order of q modulo p. So now, let me give you a name. d is the multiplicative order of q mod p. Or in other words, it's the smallest positive integer such that Q uh, such that P divides Q to the D minus one. Okay. That's I think the easiest way to see it. Uh, and if you think of it this way, then if you write N as being certain number of times this coefficient d, say ad plus r, where r is at most d minus 1, so it's less than d, then you have a copies of this guy, which, uh, so it's homocyclic of rank a, and this alpha is just the highest power of p dividing q to the d minus 1. Uh, in terms of matrices, it's very nice also to see because what you can do with SLM is that you can just look at matrices. And this A, it means that you take A by A blocks on the diagonal. And this subgroup A will sit in this kind of diagonal group. 
Uh, and of course, if it's homocyclic, it has a characteristic subgroup itself, which is elementary abelian. You just take the elements of order p in there. And it's in some way a toral subgroup. So because it sits in some kind of diagonal subgroup. And what is not in A is in fact part of a vial group of, uh, of this A. So, um, the rest I will just call it as, uh, I think I call it B. Yeah. So let me maybe call this E as elementary abelian. Uh, and yeah, so S is in fact isomorphic to A. In general, it's a semi direct product. Um, just write it as semi direct product with B, where B is contained in, uh, in some sort of value. So let's imagine that B is some sort of permutation matrices on, on this. Uh, and it's also, if your group is not too big, then that's not too bad. But you take, if you have, say, here you will have a block of size D. And you take, therefore, the symmetric group of degree A, and you take the silo piece of group of that, and that will be your B. That's how it works. Uh, and what in the two minutes I will just give you the, the hint of the method of how to do that. Essentially, what we do is that if we take now the normalizer in G of S, because A is characteristic and P is characteristic in S, it's contained in the normalizer in G of E, and we are even very ambitious because here what we do is that we take a set of generating reflections between quotes. Um, I'll just call this G sub T. So these are a set of generators. And the goal now is to show that each of these generators is in fact in the derived subgroup of some uh, local subgroup. This is the strategy. So, goal is to show that every GI belongs to the uh, to the derived subgroup of some local subgroup. <coughs> Which means the normalizer of a non-trivial piece of of S. Uh, and it works well for all, except there is always an exception with finite groups of beta uh, in the case of SL42 and P is equal to 3. So in this case, we have D is equal to 2. And what happens here, well, I, I, I'll take just a shortcut and cheat a bit, it's because I know that this guy is also a, the alternating group. Alternating group uh, of degree 8. And in there, I know that I have some exotic endotrial module, which is trivial source. It's in fact a restriction of a Young module. Uh, you take the Young module for the partition 5 3. Okay. And <laughs> carry it, you know, at once that if you restrict this guy to A8, it remains indecomposable. Uh, yes, and uh, it's therefore endotrivial. So you get in this case that um, CT of G is the two and it's also of course K of G. But otherwise we don't have any other exception. Must be careful when I say this word with the kind of groups because I know that I'm always missing one. Uh, but otherwise, that's uh, pretty much it. So, there are many other cases that could be discussed. There are some that are still being finalized for the proof, but essentially I think that uh, we now should have a pretty uh, complete picture of the, this K of G's from the finite groups of V type, whatever this means. And thank you for your attention.